Hello, everybody. This is Margareta Harris in Geneva welcoming you today, Wednesday, September 8, to this week's WHO Global Press Briefing on COVID and other health matters. We have with us today in the room the World Health Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, and as always, our WHO experts, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director, World Health Emergencies Program, Dr. Maria van Kerkhoff, Technical Lead for COVID-19, and also joining, and Dr. Bruce Aylwood, our, uh, who is the lead for the ACT Accelerator. And joining us online, we have Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, our Chief Scientist, Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director of our Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals Department, and Dr. Mar Mariangela Shimao, our Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Products. And as usual, our extraordinary interpreters will be providing simultaneous interpretation in the six official UN languages plus Hindi and Portuguese. And I thank you all in advance for what your, your extraordinary achievements. So now, without further ado, I will hand you over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Margaret. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Today, the Democratic Republic of the Congo declared an outbreak of meningitis in the northeastern Shopo province with 261 suspected cases and 129 deaths reported. Health authorities have deployed an initial emergency team and WHO is supporting the response. More than 100 patients are already receiving treatment at home and in health centers. WHO has provided medical supplies and plans to deploy more experts and resources. Meningitis is a deadly and debilitating disease with serious health, economic, and social consequences. Later this month, WHO and our partners will launch the Defeating Meningitis Roadmap, the first global initiative to address this devastating disease. The roadmap has three key objectives, ending epidemics of bacterial meningitis, like the one in DRC, reducing bacterial meningitis cases by 50% and deaths by 70%, and supporting survivors to address disability and improve quality of life. This outbreak in DRC is another reminder that although the COVID-19 pandemic continues to dominate headlines, it's far from the only health threat to which WHO is responding around the world. So many of these situations are long-term challenges that don't seem to have obvious or immediate solutions. But the COVID-19 pandemic does. People are dying who should not be. More than 50,000 people have died with COVID-19 every week since October last year. And for the past month, deaths have remained at almost 70,000 a week. We have the solutions to stop transmission and save lives. But those solutions are either not being used well or not being shared well. The inequitable distribution of life-saving tools, including diagnostics, oxygen, PPE, and vaccines is driving a two-track pandemic. Some countries with the highest vaccine coverage are now seeing a decoupling of cases and deaths, which is allowing them to reopen their societies without their health systems being overwhelmed. While cases in some of these countries are increasing among unvaccinated people, hospitalizations and deaths have remained relatively low, thanks to vaccines and earlier clinical care. However, premature relaxing of public health and social measures is putting unvaccinated and immunocompromised people at extreme risk. Meanwhile, countries with low vaccine coverage continue to see 
high case fatality rates. Additionally, some countries are refusing entry to people who have been fully vaccinated with a vaccine that has WHO emergency use listing, but which has not been approved by their own national regulators. This is creating more chaos, confusion, and discrimination, with some countries even refusing to use certain vaccines because of concern their citizens will be denied entry to other countries. WHO emergency use listing follows a rigorous process based on internationally recognized standards. All vaccines that have received WHO emergency use listing are safe and effective in preventing severe disease and death, including against the Delta variant. We thank those countries that recognize all vaccines with WHO emergency use listing, and we call on all countries to do the same. Globally, 5.5 billion vaccine doses have now been administered. But 80% have been administered in high and upper middle income countries. WHO's global targets remain to support every country to vaccinate at least 10% of its population by the end of this month, at least 40% by the end of this year, and 70% of the world's population by the middle of next year. Almost 90% of high income countries have now reached the 10% target and more than 70% have reached the 40% target. Not a single low-income country has reached either target. That's not their fault. We have heard excuses from manufacturers and some high-income countries about how low-income countries can't absorb vaccines. Almost Every low-income country is already rolling out the vaccines they have, and they have extensive experience in large-scale vaccination campaigns for polio, measles, meningitis, yellow fever, and more. But because manufacturers have prioritized or been legally obliged to fulfill bilateral deals with rich countries willing to pay top dollar, low-income countries have been deprived of the tools to protect their people. There has been a lot of talk about vaccine equity, but too little action. High-income countries have promised to donate more than a billion doses, but less than 15% of those doses have been materialized. Manufacturers have promised to prioritize COVAX and low-income countries. We don't want any more promises. We just want the vaccines. A month ago, I called for a global moratorium on booster doses at least until the end of September to prioritize vaccinating the most at-risk people around the world who are yet to receive their first dose. There has been little change in the global situation since then. So today, I'm calling for an extension of the moratorium until at least the end of the year to enable every country to vaccinate at least 40% of its population. Third doses may be necessary for the most at-risk populations where there is evidence of waning immunity against severe disease and death, such as the very small group of immunocompromised people who did not respond sufficiently to their initial dose or are no longer producing antibodies. But for now, we do not want to see widespread use of boosters for healthy people who are fully vaccinated. Yesterday, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association said that G7 countries now have enough vaccines for all their adults and teenagers 
and to offer booster doses to at-risk groups, and that manufacturing scale-up should now shift to delivering global vaccine equity, including dose sharing. When I read this, I was appalled. In reality, manufacturers and high-income countries have long had the capacity to not only vaccinate their own priority groups, but to simultaneously support the vaccination of those same groups in all countries. We have been calling for vaccine equity from the beginning, not after the richest countries have been taken care of. Low and lower middle income countries are not the second or third priority. Their health workers, older people, and other at-risk groups have the same right to be protected. I will not stay silent when the companies and countries that control the global supply of vaccines think the world's poor should be satisfied with leftovers. Earlier this week, I had the opportunity to attend the G20 health ministers meeting in Rome. I said that at the world's largest producers, consumers, and donors of vaccines, the world's G20 leading economies hold the key to vaccine equity and ending the pandemic. I called on them to support the achievement of WHO's global vaccination targets by doing three things. First, by swapping near-term vaccine deliveries with COVAX. Second, by fulfilling their dose-sharing pledges by the end of this month at the latest. And third, by facilitating the sharing of technology, know-how, and intellectual property to support regional vaccine manufacturing. We have the tools. It's clear what needs to happen. Now is the time for true leadership, not empty promises. Margaret, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. I'll now open the floor to questions from journalists. And we have a long list today. You've all got your hands up already, so I can see you're very interested in what Dr. Tedros has been saying. Um, so please keep your questions short. Keep to one question so we can get through as many as possible. Uh, first up, we have Sophie McKenna from South African Broadcasting Corporation. Sophie, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank you so much. I just want to ask uh, the Director General. You spoke about the challenges we are facing in terms of the impact of uh, COVID-19 in other uh, areas where we are supposed to uh, look at ensuring that uh, citizens of the world are able to access health care. There's a concern around the issue of HIV and AIDS that is now taking a backseat, and we see numbers rising, particularly in the sub-Sahara, and teenage pregnancy. What is the WHO's position on these issues, and how can we deal with this issue? Because having young people, young girls not being able to go to school, it will later be a problem for the world in terms of skills development and a building a better economy. Thank you, Sophie. I'm just looking around. That's quite a broad question. So Dr. Maria van Kerkhoff will start the answers. Uh, thanks, Sophie, for the question. It's, it's nice to hear your voice again. You did ask quite a, a broad question and quite a difficult one. Um, and I think there are many different elements to it. But talking about the direct impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the indirect effects of this, this obviously impacts all of us beyond the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself. It impacts all of our ability to deal with other issues um, that, are, that our countries, our people have to deal with. HIV AIDS that you mentioned, teenage pregnancy, being able to go to school. 
And I think, you know, what we have been trying to do is to look at how can we tackle the pandemic? How can we bring transmission under control, uh, drive transmission down to a low level so that we not only provide adequate care for those individuals with COVID-19, but that we can get these other services back online? We do know that individuals with HIV AIDS have a higher risk of developing severe disease. Um, we know people with other types of underlying medical conditions have an increased risk of developing severe disease um, due to infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But we also know that people with underlying conditions need care for those conditions. Um, other medical service has been severely impacted uh, because of the, the shutdowns, the lockdowns, um, inability to treat those other conditions. That is improving over time. There have been some advances with different things like telemedicine, but we are slowly starting to see countries bring these other essential services back online. Um, but you know, we really need to continue to focus on driving this pandemic down and getting control over the SARS-CoV-2 virus with this comprehensive package. It includes vaccines, it includes vaccination but it also includes all of the other, el other elements, individual level measures, the distancing, the hand hygiene, the mask wearing, improving ventilation, surveillance, good testing, um, because we need to do that so that we can care for people, not only for COVID, but for other factors. With regards to schools, um, of course, you know, we have been advocating for opening up of schools safely. You know, in areas where you can control transmission, schools operate in communities. So if you can drive transmission down, there are many ways schools can be open safely with provisions in place, uh, making sure that there's a plan, um, you know, to be able to detect cases, um, that you have a good communication plan with the, with the students, with the teachers, with the staff, with the parents of those students, looking at what you can do in the school to lower the risk of transmission, um, including physical distancing, uh, good ventilation, disinfection, the mask wearing amongst staff and children of appropriate ages. Um, and so there's a, many ways that countries have shown us that they can open schools, that school systems have shown us that they can open schools and keep those schools open safely. It is incredibly important, I don't have to tell you this, but it's incredibly important to have children in school, not only for their education, but for the safety, for their well-being, for their mental uh, well-being, safety and security. We work with UNICEF, we work with UNESCO, we work with many partners in trying to get schools uh, safely open and showing the importance. It's had a, a, this pandemic has had a tremendous detrimental effect on our kids. So it, it's a long-winded answer because it was quite a complicated question, but others may want to come in and supplement here. Um, we have to get control over this virus so that we can get on with our lives and make sure that we provide appropriate care, not only for COVID-19, but we can provide care for those who need it for all of the other problems that we face. Um, I can just maybe add, uh, the Director General, Dr. Tedros, has, has also stated a number of times in the past that we were already falling behind on SDG3, the, the, the goal related to health. And the COVID pandemic has amplified, accelerated uh, the challenges to, to being able to reach those collective goals around the world regarding health. HIV, TB and malaria have been three of the, the most important. And it is to be noted that access to prevention services and testing services for HIV uh, fell significantly, and that has a major impact down the line in terms of uh, people um, uh, contracting HIV or getting into early therapeutic services. But at the same time, the number of people actually accessing antiretroviral therapy increased, which is a te testament to the HIV treatment programs that they've managed to keep going and accelerate their impact. Uh, equally in tuberculosis, we've seen an increase in the number of people presenting uh, with multi-resistant, or the number of people accessing treatment for multi-resistant tuberculosis has fallen. That's not necessarily because the rates have fallen, but again, it's an access issue. Uh, malaria, I think, has been more stable. And with the movement and increasingly move, moving uh, malaria diagnosis and treatment into the community with community health workers and an improvement in primary health care, we've seen the resilience of primary health care oriented services which have managed to continue within communities. 
uh, while at the same time we've seen huge challenges to tertiary healthcare provision as COVID overwhelmed the health system. So uh, I, we would absolutely agree with you that there are, COVID has had a, a, a negative, notwithstanding the, the, the presence of underlying conditions that worsen the outcome for individuals who get COVID. Services for these very uh, prevention services, diagnostic services, and treatment services for these hugely important other diseases have come under severe pressure and they are struggling and they need to be protected and rebuilt. But it's also a testament to the thousands of health workers around the world who have kept those services going despite the challenges. So it's both a sign of hope uh, that we can uh, increase our support to communities through community led, primary health care led services but it also shows just how fragile those services are when we're struck with another emergency and how we have to work on resilience within our health system and the ability of the health system to cope during crisis. Uh, but, but you are very correct in, in identifying that as a major threat to our collective healthy future on this planet. <coughs> Sophie, thanks also, this is Bruce, for, for raising the issue. I just wanted to c come at one other issue linked to uh, the other points that the Director General was making this morning. Um, the WHO has done uh, a lot of work to try and understand what the drivers are and, and, and you know, the specific issues leading to these declines in testing rates and other impacts that COVID's having on, on other services, which are so crucial. And it's not just HIV, TB, but also issues like, I think, Maria, you might have mentioned antenatal screening, routine immunization services, everything got hit. And there are two issues, right? On the one side, there were demand issues where people were concerned about going to healthcare centers because of uh, COVID, but then there were also concerns on the part of healthcare workers to actually get vaccinated. And if we look at the situation we're in today, some of the countries with the highest burdens of HIV, the highest burdens of TB, some of the lowest immunization rates in the world, they also have the lowest access to COVID vaccines. And this just comes back to the theme the Director General is hammering today, is that we have got to get sufficient vaccine into the low-income countries if we are going to get the health system system safe, protect the healthcare workers so that we can get movement. All of these uh, issues are interrelated and they hinge on equitable access to the scarce products and making sure the people who really need them, the people who deliver the services you're talking about, actually get them. And you'll remember the Director General announced the 40% target and 10% targets back in May. And since May, the high-income countries, you heard in his speech, there's been fantastic progress. The low-income countries, when the Director General made his call, had about less than 1% coverage. Today, they're at 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.7% coverage. I mean, it's, it's, it's just absolutely abhorrent where it's happened, and this gap is what needs to be tackled, not just for COVID, but also for the delivery of other services, to run health services safe, and to protect the people that are out there at highest risk and who are at the cold face of this, the healthcare workers. Thank you so much to all our experts for unpacking this really difficult but really critical issue. Uh, our next question goes to Laurent Sierra, Sierra from Swiss TV. Uh, Laurent, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Oh, yeah, thanks, Margaret, for taking my question. Uh, I'd like to come back to uh, Dr. Tedros' uh, preliminary remarks because uh, you, you mentioned that you attended that G20 uh, uh, meeting last uh, weekend and uh, you met also bilaterally a lot of health ministers. So what makes you think that now they're going to be committed to honor the, their pledges and to materialize them in the, in the next month? Thank you. Thank you, Laurent. I'm looking around the room. Dr. Tedros will start. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as, as you know, the um, minister's meeting had it released its declaration at the end of uh, the meeting, and there was a clear statement in support of the 40% target that we have set for the end of uh, this year. And during that uh, meeting, uh, as a group, 
and also during my meetings um, bilaterally. Uh, they have assured me that uh, they will do everything to uh, contribute the uh, vaccines required uh, to achieve the 40% um, uh, target by the end of uh, this year. And as I said in my statement and um, several times in previous uh, pressers, the G20 countries have the means to uh, make it happen. Uh, they have the resources, they have the production capacity, and, um, you know, they should uh, make it happen. Uh, and uh, I, I, I believe and I hope, I hope uh, this time, um, you know, they will deliver on the 40% uh, on the 40% uh, target. Because one thing that we should understand is this is in the interest of uh, every country on Earth. I don't think, um, uh, you know, the... Um, disparity we have, the inequity, will help us to finish this uh, pandemic. It's only through solidarity and equitable distribution that we can end uh, uh, this pandemic. So I hope, uh, you know, they will uh, take action, and that's why today I said no more promises. I think the G20 countries, all as, as a group, have now uh, promised to support, and uh, let's see uh, the action and achieve the 40% by the end of this, uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Uh, the next question will go come from Gunila Van Hall from Svenska Media. Gunila, please unmute yourself and go and ask your question. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Very well, please go ahead. Thank you for taking my <clears throat> sorry. Thank you for taking my question. You're saying with the moratorium that you want to prolong it until the end of the year on booster doses. It doesn't seem to have worked so far, and more and more countries want to give booster doses in the richer countries. And we have autumn coming with the with the fear of more virus waves. So, what makes you think is going to work this time that people will actually put? Uh, to stop giving or put a, um, to make a pause in the booster doses. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, call for the moratorium on uh, on on um, uh, booster doses is being taken in an incredibly important uh, bigger context, uh, uh, Ganilla. There's been there's two press conferences today. You may have seen there's the one that we're holding right now to talk about this issue, and there's one earlier today at two o'clock. And at that uh, press conference, the leads on the Covax facilities released the most recent supply forecast for Covax, and what they reported was a 25 percent reduction in the number of doses that will go through Covax without urgent action by the world's G20 uh, countries, as the Director General has said, and most importantly, by the manufacturers themselves. So here we are in a situation where there's an incredible outcry across the world about the falling, uh, or sorry, about the uh, huge equity gap on vaccines that's only gotten worse since May and the call for this 40%. Um, and then there's a call for a moratorium, and uh, yes, there was different perspectives on that, but there was quite a lot of backing from the public and from others that indeed, uh, I think as Mike put it most famously, throwing another life jacket to people that already have one is not the most effective way to save lives. Um, we need to get life jackets to people that don't. And in the face of that, um, what we're seeing is the COVAX facility having to downgrade its forecast. So how can we have this commitment from the most powerful countries in the world, the producing countries in the world, the high coverage countries of the world, the manufacturers of the world, and then we have to downgrade the forecast. So at this point, we have to try and pull out every single stop to try and uh, uh, manage this situation. At the same time that this has happened in terms of vaccine supply, we've seen incredibly compelling data from high uh, coverage countries, high income countries, countries, producing countries. So where they're getting high coverage with these vaccines now, you know, you've seen it, um, they are still having COVID cases, but their COVID deaths 
are plummeting. In the countries with the low coverage, they are still having high rates of COVID deaths. And this is what we need to change and change as rapidly as possible. Should there be a moratorium on boosters? Absolutely. Should there be a moratorium on vaccinating people at low risk of severe disease or death? Absolutely. Um, so our job as the World Health Organization, the Director General at the top of this, is to make sure that we call for equity for these products on every single way possible. The other thing that's happened in the last few weeks, you know, the people have come out and said, well, it's only a few hundred million doses if we do boosters. Well, we've just had to downgrade supply by a few hundred million doses. It makes a real difference in the face of uh, scarcity, right? Um, so, so uh, um, and, and we've had lots of countries come discuss with us the moratorium and about whether booster policies can be delayed, et cetera. So it is making a difference. It is causing countries to pause, to think, have they got the right data, uh, et cetera, to back that, let alone is this going to make the greatest possible impact. So um, yes, some countries may be going ahead with decisions, others may not, but our uh, role is to make sure that we put forward uh, the strongest possible arguments and way out of this pandemic. And the way out of that is a moratorium and extended because since the last time we called for it, the equity gap's gotten greater, the amount of vaccine available to low income countries has gone down. So it's already gone on this a little bit, uh, Margaret, but there's one other point I would make. Uh, you know, to get all of the world to 40% coverage in every single country requires 2 billion doses of vaccine, right? And we had the IFPMA came out yesterday and say, look, global production is at 1.5 billion doses a month now. 1.5 billion doses a month. The absorptive capacity of the world is less than a billion right now because of what high income, upper middle income countries can do. So the volumes are there. This is a fixable problem, but it's only going to get fixed if uh, the political will, the will of the manufacturers comes together to solve it. Thank you, Bruce. And Dr. Kate O'Brien will add a few comments. Yeah, what I'd just like to add here is um, what we're really emphasizing is the access issues. But on top of the access issues, on the booster dose question, um, this is not a matter of uh, consensus scientifically or from the evidence. We're not asking to withhold something for which there is a strong set of evidence that this is needed, in fact, in order to uh, give booster doses to individuals. The vaccines are holding up very, very well against the severe end of the disease spectrum. The, the actual focus of the vaccine program is to prevent severe disease hospitalizations and deaths. And we see in the evidence that, in fact, the vaccines are performing extremely well over time and against the variants um, against these outcomes. So we'll continue to watch the evidence very carefully. But um, our expert advisory committees um, continue to see that there is not a compelling business, there's not a compelling case um, to move forward with a generalized recommendation for booster doses. As Dr. Tedros said in his opening speech, there are some very limited cases, very narrow cases, those who people who are immunocompromised, for which there is some evidence um, that is um, uh, that is certainly growing uh, to give uh, a third dose, not as a booster dose but as a, a first priming dose to assure that they have the same kind of protection as people who are not immunocompromised. So I think we also have to contextualize this in terms of benefit that it's hard to see how uh, booster doses would provide any um, substantial impact um, that would be more than the impact that is uh, achieved by people receiving their first doses. So we will always be driven by the evidence um, and I want to emphasize that um, in this, where we're, where we're certainly communicating um, very clearly about the access issues and the equity issues, this is in the context um, where we don't have strong evidence that is a compelling reason to, to move forward with boosters, even, even if there was the supply to provide for everybody. And furthermore, there are, um, uh, the vaccines are not authorized from a regulatory perspective, the regulators are also looking at uh, these data along with the, the policymakers. And I think you hear this um, in many um, places around the world. Uh, there is a, certainly not scientific consensus um, about the direction of travel on the issue of boosters. Thank you very much. And Dr. Ryan will add something. <clears throat> well, just in, in reference to the DG's position on this, uh, 
I, I can't remember who said this. So I don't know who it's attributed to, but it's a, uh, giving up is the only sure way to fail. And the Director General will not give up uh, in his responsibilities to speak for those who have no voice or to advocate for those who have no seat at the table. Um, that is his job. That is what he's here for. Uh, and therefore, there is no failure in that. There's just a continued pursuit uh, and determined pursuit of solidarity uh, and of solutions that are based on scientific products that we have developed collectively uh, around the world. So I think the Director General will continue to fight for the health justice that's required for us to get out of this pandemic. And he'll continue to speak at every forum, I believe, and he will continue to develop uh, strategies and, and, and policies that lead us in that direction. So in that sense, as, we, as I said before, in this sense, giving up is the only way, sure way, that we can fail in this endeavour. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. On that critical point, on that cri at the critical moment, we'll move to Priti Patinak from Geneva Files. Uh, Priti, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, can you hear me? Very well. Hello? Please go ahead. Yes, we can hear you yeah, well. Thanks. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was just wondering if you can share an update on um, uh, the doses that have been withheld um, from uh, the Serum Institute of India, uh, whether, whether there has been any kind of official communication from the Indian government on um, when uh, this restriction could potentially be lifted. And the second thing is, could you um, perhaps explain the logistical challenges of um, getting doses out of countries where uh, you know vaccines are expiring uh, for reasons um, that could be bureaucratic or otherwise, uh, but clearly there are a number of doses that are that are uh, getting wasted uh, because they are not able to get to deficient countries in time. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Priti. I think Dr. Aylwood will be able to answer that question. Uh, sure, I'm happy to make a comment, and and some of you or others may want to. So, with respect to uh, the resumption of vaccines from uh, from India to supply uh, Covax, I'd, I'd first like to just emphasize how important the issue is, Pretty, and thank you for raising it. Because if we look at our supply projections out through the end of the year, you know, before we made the adjustments to them, fully 30 percent of the products uh, would have been coming from that supply. So, this is absolutely vital uh, to uh, the low, low middle income countries in particular that are served through the COVAX facility. And I just wanted to assure uh, you as well that this is an area of constant uh, conversation and dialogue between the leadership of the COVAX facility, uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, uh, Dr. Berkeley, who heads up the facility, of course, uh, and, and Gavi, and others with senior members of, uh, of uh, the government of India, as well as with, of course, uh, SII itself. So the conversation is ongoing, very much alive all the time, and uh, and urging now as India has gotten its uh, its uh, delta uh, big delta wave under control, as it's now gotten vaccination coverage up. I think, as most of you will be aware, um, uh, India is nearly at 40 percent coverage for single dose, and almost half of that with uh, with two doses. So as these numbers get up there, um, there is uh, completely the expectation that they will uh, be able to open up and supply other uh, um, uh, countries in the low middle income, low income countries through COVAX uh, in the very near future. So uh, we continue to look for, um, for, for, for that. Uh, and remember, again, just the incredibly important role that um, India has played in, in supplying the world's vaccines and also, of course, the largest country, which is uh, a member of, uh, of uh, the COVAX AMC group, and that is, uh, is India itself. So um, ongoing uh, conversation, but definitely a, uh, and a really important part of the solution to reaching the uh, global 40% target by the end of this year. 
Um, you raise the other important issue about the logistical challenges of getting vaccines moved from countries where they may nearly be expiring. And um, it can be absolutely huge, pretty, and Kate may well want to speak to this as she deals with it day to day um, more than I do. But, you know, it just reinforces, again, the reason that to make sure that we use the vaccines that are available as efficiently as possible and we get them to countries that we know have the absorptive capacity to manage them and manage them in real time. This is the reason we set up COVAX. COVAX, it's almost like a global clearinghouse, right? You can get the products in there. They have constant sight every single day on what status every country is in in terms of its ability to absorb product, use product, and then it can redirect direct product very, very quickly and does that in real time. So, you know, the way that we can deal with this problem, uh, uh, pretty because the one you raise is a real one. It's very, very difficult to move vaccines if they get into countries that can't actually use them. And this is what we're going to be seeing more and more in high income and high coverage countries in the coming months. The way to control that is swap the deliveries so that they go to COVAX instead. COVAX can look across the world and solve that before we have to deal with those problems because that is very inefficient uh, if we have to deal with it that way. But Kate may want to uh, add to that. But you, you know, uh, pretty, this is the kind of problem you try and solve before it becomes a problem. Thanks. Just a couple things to add here. Um, I, I think the point that is really critical is that um, there is no country that can manage um, uh, uh, a, a, an immunization program, and especially one that is as large as a COVID vaccine program, um, without planning. And one of the most difficult things uh, that countries uh, that have, have been facing is the uncertainty about when the supply is going to come and what the expiration dates will be on those vaccines. So we have seen um, vaccines coming through COVAX in a, in a somewhat unexpected way because of the uncertainty of when the deliveries are going to happen. Um, and countries have done a phenomenal job of responding immediately to shipments that are coming and deploying them with absolute haste and speed in the face of sometimes only a couple of weeks of expiration uh, time, uh, which is an absolutely huge outlier in terms of how usual vaccine programs operate and in terms of how COVID vaccine programs in high-income countries operate. High-income countries are not dealing with this. High-income countries have the clarity and the certainty of the supply for all the reasons that Dr. Tedros has explained in, in his speech today. So I think, um, in fact, what, what is really needed at this point um, is this clarity on the supply distribution um, to uh, low and low middle income countries through COVAX, um, much greater certainty on the supply when it's going to come. And we're also seeing advances with the regulatory um, evidence with longer shelf lives of the vaccine. So all of these things together are going to improve the ability of countries to be operating in a surge mode and not just operating from emergency deployment to emergency deployment, which puts incredible stress um, on our program, no matter which kind of country we're talking about. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Brien and, and Dr. Aylwood, for explaining how difficult this is. And it's extraordinary what's been achieved. Uh, the next question goes to Simon Ateba from Today News Africa. Uh, Simon, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Thank you for taking my question. This is Simon Ateba with Today News Africa in Washington, DC. In their joint statement today, and the DG just repeated it moments ago, COVAX said only 20% of people in low and lower middle income countries have received the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine, compared to 80% in high and upper middle income countries. Here in the U.S., at least 75% of all adults have received at least one shot. COVAX also said he has raised only $10 billion out of the tens of billions of dollars needed to crush COVID-19. WHO, please pardon my friend. This this almost seems like a curse. A curse. We get a curse. The Delta variant, for instance, started in India and is now killing many people in the U.S. daily, including today. The mu variant started in Colombia and is now killing. Is now affecting people here in the U.S. 
I guess my question is, do you need to adopt a new strategy for richer countries to understand that they will never know peace until everyone knows peace, until COVID-19 is really defeated everywhere, including in Africa, and that the illusion that defeating COVID-19 in their countries will protect them will not work? Thank you. Okay, can I start here? So, Simon, I think you need to replace me in this seat up here because you have answered the question as you were asking the question. I mean, I think there, there are so many things that, you know, all of these questions are rightly so addressed to vaccines, vaccinations, and boosters. And we have to sort this out because, you know, frankly, the world is not stepping up to get the vaccines where they need to go. The DGs talked about this, Mike and Bruce, everyone's talked about this. But it's, it's about all of these other factors. There's all this notion, this talk about planning you know, about the surge that's going to happen. It's happening right now. It happened in, in Brazil, it happened in India, it happened in, it's happening right now in the United States, in my home country, where they have high vaccination coverage. The Delta variant will not be the last variant of concern that you will hear us talking about. You mentioned the Mu variant. There are others that are circulating. The surge of not only preparing for vaccination, but improving our surveillance systems, getting tests out there so people know where the virus is circulating, make sure that we handle and, and appropriately manage mass gatherings or postpone them, make sure that we fix ventilation in our building, make sure that our workplaces have plans that people who have to go to work can go to work, and so on and so on, making sure that there's consistent communication, clear communication about how we need to use these tools. It doesn't exist right now. You ask for a new plan. The plan exists. The plan for controlling COVID-19 was issued on the 4th of February, 2020, four days after the Director General declared a public health emergency of international concern. That plan has been adapted over time. It now includes vaccination. Don't say that that plan doesn't exist. I would like to see articles showing that plan exists. The story is about how we implement them. The story is about how we use the tools that we have to prevent infections and to save people's lives. Right now, we have tools that can save people's lives. We have tools that can suppress transmission, which minimize, which reduce the opportunity for this virus to evolve, for variants to emerge. You are, you are right on with your question, but we need people to step up. We need global leadership taking a stand and showing that we can take control over this virus. We haven't done that. There is a false sense of security that if your population reaches a certain percentage, that you will be safe. The Delta variant is showing us that, and it's not the first variant of concern. You remember Alpha variant across Europe. Remember Gamma, remember Beta. Now Delta is showing us that we cannot sit on our laurels. We have to remain vigilant and do what we can to not only get vaccine equity around the world, but to ensure that we stop this virus from circulating as much as we possibly can. We lost that opportunity to eliminate it at a global level very early on, but we still have the power right now, all of us, to be able to, to drive that transmission down. So I think we need to, you know, prove me wrong that, you know, we, we won't be able to do this, but I think we can. And I think countries have shown us over and over that we can. We just really need to step up. Thank you, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, Dr. Aylwood will come in, and then Dr. O'Brien will also ha have some comments to make. Well, I, I think it's an important point you're making, Simon. You know, what's the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. Um, and in this situation, though, um, the outcome we need is more doses of vaccine, more equitable sharing of uh, what are really scarce resources to make sure they have the biggest impact possible and save the most lives possible. Um, the strategy is right. The strategy is absolutely sound. The work plan for trying to implement that strategy potential solutions to um, addressing the equity problem through donations, through delivery swaps, et cetera. There's only so many ways you can uh, skin a cat, so to speak. Um, and, and, and those have been laid out very, very clearly by the Director General uh, week after week. So it's, it's not as much new strategies as uh, new voices to help, um, help uh, uh, move the political agenda and the manufacturer agenda in the direction needed from the vaccine piece, at least. And one of the things the Director General has established, as you'll be aware, is a multilateral leaders task force. Uh, because, Simon, you were asking that question, are 
people appreciating that we have to be in this together to solve that uh, uh, this problem. And so this multilateral leaders task force now brings together um, Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF, it brings David Malpras, the head of the World Bank Group, along you know led by the Director General, along with Dr. Ngozi at the World Trade Organization, a very powerful group of voices to make that economic argument as well as the health argument, as well as the trade arguments, because all of these things add up and are crucial to uh, to to getting out of this uh, getting out of this pandemic. So just as we're bringing those voices together at the international level, though politicians will react to a domestic agenda. So we need these same you know voices, leadership out of the national agendas from the high coverage countries, from the countries of the producing uh, uh, vaccine producing nations, to help those leaders make the decisions to prioritize COVAX because we need to change the color of the map very, very rapidly if we're going to get out of this pandemic together exactly as you said, Simon. So what we need are more and more voices, more and more of a movement. Uh, as you can hear, we're all getting kind of hoarse, but we need more help uh, on this. And that help has got to come from uh, from you, from uh, the media telling the story, from uh, the uh, leaders at the country level, because the international leaders are definitely doing their part. Dr. O'Brien's got something to add. Yeah, so I, I think you, you've really, you, obviously, you've really hit the nail on the head here, as Maria has said, and, and Bruce has said. And let me just add a couple of things here. We've been saying for over a year, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. And the emergence of variants is really coming from where transmission is most happening. And transmission is most happening where people are unvaccinated. Um, so th this is no surprise uh, that uh, saying that nobody is safe until everybody is safe, that, that's not a slogan. It's, it's science. It's epidemiology. It's about the transmission of this virus. And I think the world is starting to wake up to the fact that it's true and that we've been saying it because it's true. So the calls to action, the policies that we have, the policies that the director general is describing and explaining and calling for action on things are those things that are grounded in the evidence for what will stop this pandemic. And I think we want to really emphasize that on the vaccine side, we need clear action. As the director general said, we've, we've heard the promises we appreciate the promises, but those now need to turn into actions now, today, next week, and in the months to come, so that deployment of vaccines can actually go at an incredible pace to achieve the 40% target by the end of the year. Those are the things that need to happen. And we think that people are starting to really understand that this is not a slogan that we're uh, repeating. It's actually based on what you can observe is actually happening, which we knew was going to be the case unless people acted. And so, as Maria said, there's still time to act, but the longer the there's a delay in doing that, the longer this pandemic is going to persist and the more consequences there are from an economic, a social, and a health perspective. And that's what we want to short circuit and get to the end of this. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Brien. And I think on that very strong note, we're coming up to the hour, so we'll wrap up this press conference. I'll hand it over to Dr. Tedros for some final remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And um, thank you also to all media colleagues for joining us uh, today. And look forward to seeing you in our upcoming presser. So thank you. <laughs>